Today I'll be showing off all the steps I use when basing characters for my armies, talking through how my approach differs when basing regular troops, and looking at some general principles and techniques you can apply in your own projects. Although all three models I'll be showing today are from my Garant Dwarf project, the ubiquity of the so-called tactical rock in GW sculpted bases of late shows that this kind of landscape is as relevant for any fantasy army as it is for 40k. All you have to do is just dry brush things up using lighter, sandier browns, a Martian red, dark grey for rubble, and skip or change the colour of the static grass, and you'll have a diverse range of bases for whatever setting you choose. The three models I'll be using today are the Battle Standard Bearer from the limited edition Army Box, a Dwarf Lord Sculpt from the 6.5 edition Range Refresh, and a Runesmith. This is the old Crag the Grim model. Start by cutting a square of cork measured using the top surface of the base itself. This is mostly there just to raise the figure up for some extra elevation over other models in the army or unit, around and on top of which I'll then be placing other scatters and textures and bits of rock. If you're working with metal figures, I find it helpful at this point to mark onto the underside of the cork the position of the slot in the base by just drawing through it with a pen, and then you can carefully cut out that slot with a sharp knife. As you test for everything together, Draw around the outline of the figure onto the cork so that you can see the area you'll need to leave as a minimum to support the model. There's little that looks more unnatural than a perfect straight line of cork on a base, so working around that outline that I've traced, I'm going to tear off bits of cork to leave a broken and irregular finish on the material. Then glue it onto the base with some super glue, being careful of course to keep the two slots in the cork and the base itself aligned. Because the tab will mostly be locating into cork rather than the plastic base itself, I'm going to pin the figure as well for some added security. You probably don't need to do this for most characters, but with something as precarious as this battle standard bearer, I think it's worth the added effort. Just make sure that wherever you're drilling into, there's enough depth so you're not going to be poking a drill through a bit of a rare expensive figure. I'm sure many of you will have pinned figures before, so I'm not going to go into too much depth but I've cut a small piece of paper clip. I'm going to super glue that into the hole I've made in the figure, press it down onto the cork in the right place so I can see where to drill the corresponding hole in the base, drill that through, and then glue both the underside of the figure and the pin and press it into the base itself. Even with the rough outline we tore into the cork, it's still going to end up looking like cork if it's left untreated. So I'm going to take some bits of flint that are roughly the same height as the cork, with which to imitate an exposed rock face. If you can find any near you outside, then just use that of course, but if not, I got a small bag of these flint chippings in a pack of basing materials from War World Scenics, along with various other grades of sand gravel mixes that I'll be using later on in the tutorial. Once you've found a bit that you're happy with, score along it with an old pair of clippers, uh, roughly where you're going to cut so that it fits around the figure. The scoring I found helps to leave a clean break in the flint when you do cut it, then preferably wearing some eye protection in case any shards come flying off, but at the very least using a pot to catch the bits. Firmly squeeze the clippers along the line. With your bits of flint, mark where you'll need to cut into the cork so that everything lines up, and carefully slice off whatever you don't need with a sharp knife. Be careful at this step as the cork has obviously been super glued down onto the base, so there's a bit of resistance as you're cutting. Then with more super glue, fix the flint in place. So, here are three characters on their elevated bases. The next product I use is a ground texture from Vallejo. This is the rough grey pumice one. This is where I should add the basic method becomes identical for both characters and basic troops. Everything up till this point is simply too much faff to do across 18, 24 models or however many you have in a unit, and wouldn't then serve to differentiate characters meaningfully at all from the other models if everything was done the same way. So on top of your cork and rock foundation, or plain plastic base in the case of iron breakers or what have you, start carefully applying a thin layer of the pumice texture. I'm not too bothered with the colour that it comes out since we're going to be painting everything afterwards, but I just find the texture of this particular one the best for a rough ground. It's the same material I use on all my multi-based figures, and these tubs have lasted a very long time for me, compared to the tiny little pots that GW Texture Paints come in. To introduce some more variety to the ground texture, I'll be selectively applying this fine gravel sand mixture in small clumps onto the bases. To secure this I'm using a basing glue from Geek Gaming Scenics, but any strong PVA will do. You'll have seen the same steps from this point on in my review and tutorial of GW's movement tray perhaps. I'll link that in the corner of the screen. 
Just remember that any step to use for the models themselves can easily be replicated on movement trays to tie everything together. Here's our paint the rest of the owl moment. At this stage, you'll want to finish the figures themselves. This is particularly important if you're going to be applying washes to large areas of the model as that will inevitably leave spots on your finished base otherwise. But it's also important because of static grasses and so on getting the way of reaching into parts of the model like the standard bearer's trailing beard. I have various tutorials for painting the armour and equipment on dwarves that I show with an ironbreaker model, as well as skin and faces on characters using the Lord with Great Weapon that you've seen on this video, which I'll link in the description below. So, being careful to avoid the model, I'm going to start painting over the basic Fayeco ground texture in Mournfang Brown. Next, paint the exposed rock and those contrasting patches of the sand gravel mixture in Dawnstone. Then, it's an all over wash in Agrax. Followed by dry brushing on top of the Mournfang Brown, first in Gawthor Brown, and then more lightly with Tyrant Skull. I'm going to reinforce the darker colour of the rocky areas with Nuln Oil. Then apply their dry brushes of Dawnstone and Administratum Grey. Onto the static grass. This is the 2mm Summer Mixture from Jarvis Scenix again applied with a fast drying basing glue from Geek Gaming Scenics. Depending on what type of landscape you're envisaging for the army, apply your glue over some or most of the areas of soil that you've painted. Apply the static grass onto the base and lightly tap off any excess material. Last but certainly not least, paint the edge rims in a neutral colour. Just look at the difference between one with the painted rim and one without if you need any extra encouragement. They look just incomplete and messy without it, I think. I'm personally not a fan of the brown rims that GW Studio uses, so I always use black instead. I think it helps to frame the model better. And with that, we have our completed bases. If I had to simplify it down to five basic principles, they would be 1. Height, or rather elevation, is important. Sorry, dwarves. By raising a figure even just slightly above the rest of the troops around them in a unit, it can help clearly identify a character and lend a sense of greater importance to the figure. 2. But, you still want the army to be unified, so don't do something completely different for the character if it doesn't at least resemble the techniques you've used on other models. 3. Cork needs to be incorporated with thought and care into bases. It has its uses as a structural element in the base, to provide underlying contours to your texture paint and so on, but on its own it tends to look unnatural, and because we're so familiar with it, any wargamer is going to recognise it as cork from some distance. 4. Paint everything that goes onto the base, even when using actual stones to represent stones, or twigs to represent branches and so on. This may sound strange, but next to a painted figure, the scale and the way it interacts with the light will just look unnatural unless it has been painted. And five, think carefully about the scale of the project when planning out which methods you're going to use across which particular figures and types of model. For some centerpiece figures with slightly larger bases, like the Harbinger of Decay in my Nurgle army, I needed to elevate it further still. Or for something more elite, like my Sisters of Battle Kill team, I could justify going much further on each individual model by building up bits of rubble wall and so on, as well as the techniques shown here encompassing different surfaces, textures and changes of height. Hopefully you'll find some use for these tricks in your own projects. Basing in terrain is something quite arts and crafty, where you can have some fun and experiment with new techniques, so hobby boldly and good luck with anything you're working on. Until next time!